uh, well, welcome once again. Um, so what we're going to work on today is the topic of building for open. All of you have a project and a lot of you are working on building a community and a lot of you are trying to build a software that's an open source software where you want to involve people as users or co-developers. Um, what we will do now is send you in a breakout room where uh, you will get to know each other a bit well while talking about two topics a project which went very well a project that wasn't very well um and with that i hope you can send you to breakout rooms okay um so i've set this up it looks like we have three to four people per breakout room um, and just the idea of discussing the uh your experience with openness like one time that went well and one time that wasn't so great uh, and with three to four people per room in about 10 minutes, that gives you two to three minutes each and we'll sort of warn you as time passes so that you know what's going on. Is that all clear? Thumbs up if yes. Okay, I have nods and thumbs up. And remember, you can always raise your hand or you can ask for help, actually, if anything is not clear or if you need any advice. Uh, and I am about to send you in. I should see it pop up on your screens in a moment. Yeah, one of my favorite example of train wreck is lack of motivation and commitment during voluntary project. I think this is something most of us will come across because of our uh, work, which is supposed to be helped by volunteers. Uh, because it's not only about how we help them with their lack of motivation, but how do we rightly acknowledge their work. Oh. Hackathon can go quite either direction, good or bad. Yeah, lack of leadership. Um, it's good to have a little bit structure in your community and plan. Someone wants to verbalize their example that they are really excited about to share with everyone. Okay, there's a good example, which is open source video game. Contributors get different badges. Gamification. I'm really interested to know a bit more about that. Who wrote that down? Holcomb wrote that down. Uh, that was my example. It's a video game habit tracker that called Habitica, and that's open source. And whenever you contribute to the code or uh, fix an issue, you get a little badge by your avatar. So everyone is, everyone can see that you contributed and everybody loves getting presents and games. So it's good motivation. That's really cool. I wish we had gamification in a lot of other work we did. We are probably not as creative there. I just want to throw in, I'm sometimes a little wary of gamification because whilst it's awesome, if you're not careful, sometimes people work so hard to earn the badge or to the, earn the check mark that you end up incentivizing the wrong things by accident. Um, but definitely not saying that it doesn't have a place, just that it needs to be used cautiously. Absolutely, yeah. Personal care is very important. Anyone else wants to throw their example for everyone to hear? No? All right. Then I'll let you take over and do the next bit. Thank you so much, Mavika. And thank you, everyone, who was in the breakout room. So I hope you had some interesting uh, discussions and introspections onto uh, examples for good and bad open practices. Um, if ever anyone has any ideas, you can continue to comment or discuss about those as well. Uh, but anyway, we'll move on to the second section uh, that, that we're going to be working on. We're going to be talking about um, the project structure. So 
Uh, Open Life Science is we build around using GitHub as a way to share our work. Um, and that is equally true even if your project isn't technical. Um, I know a lot of you actually, we've seen you working and commenting on each other's GitHub issues and doing a lot of collaboration. Uh, and it makes it very easy to work together online. Um, there are other things available such as Bitbucket uh, or uh, GitLab, which is actually open source, uh, but we had to pick one and GitHub is quite popular, which is why we've stuck with that one. Uh, but most of these will apply to any other place as well. Uh, so we're going to talk today about four different files uh, that are pretty standard in open projects. The, the four are a license file, which basically tells people how you can legally reuse content on a GitHub repository or other repository. Need to remember not, to, not just GitHub. Uh, README, which is basically the entry point, is the first thing anyone sees. Contributing, uh, just guidelines telling people how they can contribute to your project. And the final one, uh, but definitely not the least one, Code of Conduct, uh, which is just a set of rules that we agree upon uh, for acceptable behavior in our community. So uh, thankfully, my friend uh, Josh Simmons has agreed to talk about uh, licensing today. He's the Vice President of the Open Source Initiative, currently working for Salesforce and previously for Google. Um, and so Josh, are you ready to talk a bit about licenses? Yes, I am. Uh, let me see if I can share this here. Let's see. Uh, well, as I work out the technology on my end, because uh, such is life. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm Josh Simmons. I am, uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, uh, do open, corporate open source for Salesforce, previously for Google, which is where I met Yo, because I, I helped run the Google Summer of Code program. Um, and I am really delighted to be here. Um, I am web developer of many, many years and a uh, community organizer. And I, I, I've started specializing in open source because um, I think the commons is probably uh, one of the most important things uh, that like civilized society can develop. Um, and I'm really amazed at the outcomes that we have when we share knowledge. Um, and I know that open access and uh, open source is particularly important in the life sciences now uh, especially in light of the, the reprodu reproducibility issues that uh, that have been coming out. So uh, just disclaimer, I am not a lawyer. I am definitely not your lawyer. This is not legal advice, uh, but I do swim among licensing experts. Um, and as my role as vice president of the Open Source Initiative, uh, I have, have some useful thoughts. Uh, or, or hopefully they'll be useful. So yeah, that's me. Uh, this is a, a thank you, by the way, for the slide deck that, that, that came pre-prepared. I'm going to speak to it as, as best I can. Uh, but suffice it to say, open source, uh, open licensing more generally um, is a fantastic way to make your, your work available to people, uh, to collabor collaborate, especially across institutions. Uh, I've worked inside of companies that used open source licensing just so that they could collaborate with other subsidiaries seamlessly. Uh, and so it's, it's kind of incredible the boundaries that open source allows us to, uh, to, to work across. Are these- uh, are, Just a quick check, uh, Josh, should we be seeing slides? I think so, let me- <laughs> Okay. Let me, let me try this again. Uh, so we can see the uh, cohort call notes right now. Well, that is, uh, ah, I see. I selected the wrong tab, I'm so sorry. We see them, brilliant. Woo, okay. So this, this is, uh, this is when I said, this is me. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, the, the fantastic thing is once you've got open licensing on something, it makes it so much easier to collaborate with people uh, and for people to build on your work. Um, but I think largely the folks here, I, I think I'm probably preaching to the choir with that. So uh, I'm gonna move merrily along. Uh, so one of the things that we spoke about in our breakout session briefly was that, you know, I, I may be specializing, uh, specialized in open source uh, and uh, ostensibly I have sort of 
a, a sense of like best practices for how to build a project that's open from the very beginning. Um, but there are, uh, but even even given the expertise that I have, uh, I, I have struggled to build open projects. Um, oftentimes, they take a little, they take more forethought and planning uh, than they might otherwise. And particularly when you're working on deadlines, uh, sometimes it's it's you know in, in tech it's really unfortunate that often you know things like accessibility and security or open sourcing often end up being afterthoughts. Um, and so, like my own experience has shown that to be true despite my expertise. Um, so I think uh, really just want to implore people to plan ahead of time to uh, to to take the time. Uh, to think about these things so that you can build for an open project from the very beginning. Because um, ultimately, the reason we do open source and, and open licensing is because the values outweigh the, 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 the costs of doing that planning. Uh, but we just need to sort of root ourselves in our commitment to being open uh, so that we do take that time up front to make it happen. So a huge, when, when people talk about open source, uh, they're often, it's a term that's a little overloaded. Um, open source uh, technically just speaks to licensing, right? An open source license is a license that conforms to the open source definition. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and so there are open source projects that are out there that people will just put an open license on it but they may not actually accept, be interested in collaborating with people. Maybe they just wanted to share it. Um, or maybe they, they are, they're interested in collaborating with people, but only people within their organization. Um, and so often when I think about open source, I think about three really important aspects of it. First is the licensing, because um, everything sort of flows from, from that. Um, but the second is the uh, sort of the collaboration model. When people think about open source, it's they're often uh, implying something about the way that people collaborate around a project. Uh, that is that you know, the source code and the assets are freely available and inspectable and that anybody can open a pull request or raise an issue and, and that'll be triaged and accepted from the community. Uh, and the last component is not just the open collaboration, but open governance. Um, and this is, this is one of the uh, more tricky aspects, but you know, for instance, uh, let's look at the uh, Google's Android open source project. It's an open source project. It is under an open source license, uh, but it does not use the open collaboration model because uh, they don't accept pull requests or issues from people outside of the company. And it's not openly governed uh, because, well, it's, it is a Google project and they decide everything that goes on with it. You compare that to projects like uh, NumPy or SciPy, where these are projects that are under open source licenses. Uh, they are owned, uh, they, they have an open collaboration model, and they're also governed by foundations and nonprofits that have like an open governance uh, scaffolding. So that there are ways to not just be a contributor, but ultimately to you know, join the technical steering committee or uh, participate in decisions about the outcomes of the project. So I just wanna unpack open source broadly because it, it means a lot of different things to different people. And you can see how those three facets can contribute to uh, sometimes the misunderstandings. And it's really important for us to understand what our intent is, what level of openness we're working towards when we're uh, building a project. Uh, suffice it to say a successful open source project is a lot more than just an open source license. And uh, there are a lot of details here that are included. Like you know, at the beginning of the call, we mentioned a code of conduct. Um, you know, event planning, and there's just so much that goes into it. Uh, but let's not uh, let's not get overwhelmed with it, because you know, one one step at a time as we build open projects. So all open licenses share these three things in common. Um, the the Free Software Foundation has like the four freedoms. The open source definition has the the ten uh, ten clauses that things must uh, be compliant with to become open source. But ultimately, they all share three things in common. That anyone can use the work for any purpose, that anyone can modify the work, and people can share that work freely as well. 
Um, in any license, there are both the rights that you get as well as the responsibilities. Uh, no matter how simple or brief the license is, uh, any effective license, uh, certainly any OSI approved license is going to have both of those sections. There are, op there are open style licenses out there like uh, the beerware license or the WTFPL uh, that just says do whatever that you want. Um, and those are uh, essentially considered to be like the WTFPL license is considered to mo like be most similar to like a, a public domain uh, commitment. Um, and interestingly, public domain is not open source. There's some interesting uh, literature around that. Um, in fact, CC0 is also not open source, uh, but it's but it's a good it's a good thing. So I'm never going to dissuade people from using it. The history there is complex. Uh, but as I was saying, there are rights and responsibilities. And often one of the responsibilities that comes with an open license is the responsibility of attribution. Um, so that means, uh, you know, declaring who the, who the original author was or where you got it from and, and linking back to that. You'll often notice uh, in particularly it, like in your software applications that, um, Ah, good question. I'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, you'll often notice if if you in the software that you use, there's there's usually like you know an about screen, and in that about screen, there's often a declaration of of open source licenses and attribution, and so that is where that software maker is honoring their responsibility to uh, to attribute. Uh, CC BY is a license. Um, in fact, all of the all of the Creative Commons licenses are licenses, even CC0, which is in, a, in practice effectively a commitment to the public domain, is also a copyright license. So all of these are, are, are licenses that are uh, spelling out uh, uh, your rights and all but CC0 really also spell out your responsibilities. Because CC0 is sort of a commitment to the public domain, there is no responsibility. There is no requirement for attribution. Uh, there is no copyright holder. Um, they've, they've sort of disclaimed their ownership at that point. But, but again, these are all copyright licenses. They are, they are hacks on the copyright system. Um, and so, you know, even the copy left things or the public domain CC zero things, though they're copyright licenses, they're, they're explicitly about disclaiming the copyright. So I mentioned copyleft, um, and broadly speaking, in open source, uh, there are two broad subsets of licenses. Um, there are the permissive licenses, or non-reciprocal, and there are definitely different words used here. Sometimes the words have baggage, uh, so I, I try to be pretty even-handed in how I describe them. Um, permissive licenses, uh, like MIT BSD or the Apache License 2.0, uh, they don't require, so, so, so say you take a piece of software and you make a derivative work from it, you, you modify it. Um, in a permissive license, you are not required to share your modifications under that same license. You can license them differently. You can license them under proprietary license. That's, that's totally up to you and it's, it's your prerogative to decide what, what you want to do there. On the other side, we have copyleft licenses. And even in this category, there's a continuum from, from weak to strong copyleft. Um, and these are sometimes called reciprocal licenses because I, as someone who has authored, say, GPL v3 software that you are now using uh, and you are now modifying and creating derivative works with, because it's under the GPL v3, you are, have a responsibility to provide your modifications under that very same license. Um, and there's things out there like the AGPL, which is a, a, a strong copy left license that specifically speaks to uh, software that operates over a network. Um, ultimately, these are all valid and good licenses. Um, and picking one, uh, don't worry, it doesn't need to be too complicated. Uh, but ultimately, you, you will need to make a decision about uh, depending on the use case of your project, uh, what, what is appropriate for you.
So open source is really all about copyright. Uh, it's not about trademark. Uh, and of course, there are at least three areas of intellectual property law. There's, there's copyright, there's trademark, and then there's also patents. Largely, open source licenses don't say much about patents. Um, some of them do explicitly, this explicitly uh, include a patent grant to the people who are uh, using that software. Um, the precedent that the whole industry is operating under right now is that even if an open source license doesn't in explicitly include a patent grant, the operating assumption is that there is an implicit patent grant at the very least. Um, so I know that patents, uh, and especially in, in context of academia, there's a question of, of tech trans or translation. How does this technology or how does this, this work uh, get translated to, uh, to, to industry or to something that'll drive impact? Um, and I know that uh, I was just recently at Johns Hopkins um, trying to help, help some of their good people in their library persuade their tech, tech transfer people that uh, you know, open licensing is not, uh, is not to be feared. Uh, and so anywho, patents are often one of the things that people get a little, uh, you know, people who are not used to open licensing, they can be sort of afraid of, of the prospects here. Um, but suffice it to say, patents, uh, there's an implicit, if not an explicit patent grant when you put an open license on something. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't patent things. It just means that you're, there's, there's a grant that's flowing through that license. So there are happily uh, tools and resources out there to help you navigate choosing a license. Um, Choosealicense.com is pretty great. Creative Commons has a lot of really plain language uh, explanations of the different licenses that they have. Um, the number one thing that I would recommend is looking, you know, not only looking at these resources, but if you are uh, creating a project or, or you know, writing some code to, to to, to analyze some results or whatever the case may be, um, look at the licenses that are common in the community you're releasing the code into. So uh, in the JavaScript ecosystem, uh, it's often the MIT or the BSD license. Uh, in the PHP ecosystem or in Java, uh, it's often the Apache license. Um, and like, there's no value judgment on those things. It just happens to be sort of common practice within those communities to use a given license. Um, and so if you're looking for um, collaboration and participation from people in that community, you know, abiding the community norms is a pretty, pretty solid way to start um, engaging with them. So consider both what is typical in that community, as well as what the specific constraints and, and goals are of your project. Uh, and these resources will help you navigate that, those decisions. So open source is really, really just about code, um, which is, you know, obviously the work that we all do is so much bigger than just software. Um, we deal with data, we deal with imagery, we deal with other, all manner of assets, we deal with hardware. Um, there are open source hardware licenses. Um, and Creative Commons does a fantastic job of providing licenses for open, open data and sort of open content. So whether it's for the white paper or the textbook or the data set that goes along with the project, uh, Creative Commons is a really, really fantastic sort of catch-all uh, set of licenses. And of course, there are variations that include, uh, you know, at, require attribution or require you to share your code, the derivative works in the same way. Um, and then there are ones that even are, have a non-commercial clause. Of course, once we add non-commercial clauses, well, that gets even further from open source and open licensing because then we're making judgments and putting restrictions on who can, who can really use it. Um, so there's a question here about what happens when we import multiple libraries from other projects um, and which licenses uh, applied to the work that we're creating. So this is a really good question. Um, there are two triggers in licenses, uh, generally to be aware of. Um, one trigger is distribution. Uh, 
which is like the moment that you are distributing uh, the software, whether that's, you know, I'm running it on a web server and you're using it or, uh, uh, or I'm sending you software that's on a disk or I'm sending you a little robot or a little sensor that has software I've built on it. Those all count as forms of distribution. Um, and the distribution uh, usually has, that's where some of the responsibilities kick in, like the attribution um, or the requirement to share your work in the same way. Um, when you inevitably end up using software that's licensed multiple different ways, uh, the one that applies to you, well, apologies, let me back up. So first distribution, second is the derivative works. And in copy and copy left, the moment you make a derivative work, and that means really modifying that software. So if you look at a, uh, the Linux operating system, uh, there's broad agreement and under, understanding that if I modify the Linux operating system itself, that's me creating a derivative work. And therefore, the software, because it's a, under a copyleft license, the software I create needs to be shared under that same license. However, if I'm building an application on top of Linux, you know, similar to like, okay, I'm not modifying Windows, but I'm building a software for people who use Windows, same thing, Linux, Mac OS, what have you. Um, if I'm building something in the user space on Linux, that's not a derivative work. Um, and so I'm not required to distribute my work under the license that, that Linux is under, which is GPLv2. So the most restrictive license isn't necessarily the one apply that applies to your work. You have to ask yourself two questions. Uh, what are you distributing? And what are you deriving your work from? Um, and those are obviously like, not always trivial questions to come up with answers with, um, but there are lots of good people in the community who are, are happy to provide advice on these things. Um, obviously, always recommend speaking to legal counsel, but I'll also say that the open source initiative does a lot of low key consulting for people, um, you know, whether it's the, uh, you know, the EU and their copyright directive or uh, the US and their federal open source policy or various agencies trying to figure out how to use open source or, or universities doing the same. Uh, there are, we exist and we're happy to help uh, provide guidance. So uh, here are a number of resources that I think, uh, there were a few that were already included here. I added a couple, my, a few myself. Um, these are excellent resources for getting more information, uh, both about the licensing and more generally building open source communities. Um, you know, open source guide is one that I've added here that specific that includes questions of licensing, but also like, okay, how do I build a community around this? What are really the key components of a community? You know, code of conduct is a great start, but what about the governance? How do we rec recognize our contributors? Um, how do I set expectations with the community? What expectations do they need me to set? You know, all of these questions, uh, I'm happy to say are like not new. Um, and so there's a lot of prior art out there uh, to help provide guidance on these matters. Um, Forge Your Future with Open Source. Uh, I apologize, that's a, that's, a, that's a book. It's not open source book either. Uh, and, and further apologies, disclaimer, it's written by a good friend of mine. But it is a really, it's, it is the only book that is written specifically for newcomers to open source. Um, and I think it has a lot of uh, really useful information in that regard. Uh, Producing OSS is a, a book that is open source uh, from Carl Fogel, one of the former directors of the Open Source Initiative. Uh, incredibly useful information. And uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't underscore the open source definition there at the top. Uh, that is of course the definition that the organization I'm a part of stewards and uses to judge whether a new license is open source or not. Um, so I think, I think that's the extent of what I've got for you. And I apologize, I think I might've gone over time, but I, I hope that was useful. Thank you so much, Josh.
Uh, no, that was really amazing. Uh, especially great to hear from uh, specifically the Open Source Initiative. Uh, so um, we are going to move uh, straight on, I think, to the uh, readme sections. So if anyone has any questions for Josh, uh, feel free to add them in the document. Uh, Josh maybe can keep an eye on that to answer any questions or comments there may be. Uh, but I think we'll just move straight on to talking about readme's. Uh, Mateusz, are you here and ready? Yes, I am. I will try to share my screen. Let's see if it works. Um, okay, can you... Hmm. What can you see? Can you see my slides? It says or? you've started screen sharing, but it's black. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, there uh, we go. We can see it now. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Uh, and you see slides, you don't... Okay. Read me for uh, open projects. Yeah, but now I can't see. <laughs> Uh, because I see your faces and then, okay. They're lovely uh, faces. I know. Okay, <laughs> so uh, hello, I will be talking about the, the readme files uh, and how you can uh, implement or like how, how can you uh, write the readme files for your project. But first of all, like why, why would you and what is the role of the readme files? Um, ah, but now I can't, uh, yeah, okay. So actually I look at the same as Josh, yeah? <laughs> Um, so yeah, I already introduced myself, but uh, briefly, my name is Mateusz Kuzak. I work at the Netherlands eScience Center, and actually, uh, uh, quite a lot of my work is involved in training and around software best practices, uh, where we also teach uh, how to run open source projects. Uh, so, creating readme files is one of the things that we we teach. Actually, um, whenever I talk about open source, I say you should start with. Uh, when you're uh, starting open source project, you actually start with open sourcing it from day one, but then start with the readme file. This should be the first thing that you're actually writing. Um, so I will talk about uh, how to use readme uh, to communicate uh, your project effectively, um, learn how to write the crew description of your project. Uh, I will um, list some examples uh, where you can find more, so you can follow the, the links, you can look at different examples. Uh, but also some more resources about uh, how to write uh, a readme file. Um, and then after I stop talking, you will actually create your, uh, or revise your readme files or the project descriptions. Uh, so I believe the, uh, this is where we are in the OLS project. Uh, so the, the readme file touches upon communication and people understanding uh, what your project is about. Um, and actually, so this is the, the, I guess, the motto of the Open uh, Leaders, uh, uh, yeah, Open Life Sciences project. But actually, I like it because it fits very well with the what, why do we need README files? Because you want to empower others to collaborate. And if the, the README file is there to actually empower them, yeah? So the, the, to give them tools and to give them channels and to give them uh, the reasons to collaborate with you, yeah? Uh, and then the readme file is a bit like a, like a doormat where uh, people see it before they even enter the project, yeah? <laughs> they, they, this is the first thing they see. Um, so what is a readme file? Uh, you already mentioned that uh, this project, like we, we do use GitHub as an example of, uh, or like we use it for, as a collaboration platform. So the GitHub um, uh, uses readme files uh, as a, like the, the first uh, thing that people see uh, as a description of the product. So re readme is in principle a, a, a file, which is called readme, uppercase uh, readme. Uh, it could be readme.md because usually, uh, and especially on GitHub, uh, the format or the, the language that you would write the readme in uh, would be markdown. So that's why it's readme.md. Uh, for Markdown, uh, but it co if you don't use GitHub, if you have some uh, use some other platform, the README could be a web page, like the front page of your project, uh, describing your project. Um, and so, as I mentioned, if you if you uh, README is a file, uh, and in this file you describe what uh, your project about, and then if you put this file in the root of your project on GitHub then this would be the first thing people see when they go to GitHub, uh, on GitHub uh, to your project. Um, 
So this is the, really the first opportunity and often the only opportunity, because if you lose this opportunity and people get discouraged on, or don't get int uh, interested uh, in your project, they might not come back. So you should like uh, seize this opportunity and uh, describe your project well. Um, so what should go into the readme? Uh, describe what you're doing or what the project is doing. Who is the audience of the project? Why people should be using your project or like the, the tools that you're developing and so on. Why people would care. Uh, how does this project uh, differ from other similar projects? And uh, maybe why uh, people would like to get involved in this project in the first place. Um, how to get started, which could mean how to get started with using the things that the project is about or how to get started as a contributor. And I think this is something that you have to keep in mind that the README often will be for both types of audience. It will be to the people who will use the things that your, uh, your project is about or people who would like to contribute or collaborate on them. <coughs> um, and then also list the resources. Um, so this is uh, the, the example of the, uh, of the README file, uh, how it can be uh, found on GitHub. This is project by Kirsty Whitaker. Uh, and you can see here, like there is a welcome message. You want to warmly welcome people who come uh, see your project. There is a description. Um, there are links, uh, descriptions, how to, so links to the documents on how to contribute or how to get involved. What is the license? What is the code of conduct? So this is also like a, a, um, a place which will uh, a map to your project. Yeah, so people will find all the links that are relevant for your project. So they should be able to find all those things from the README file. And um, so what else? Uh, I think I believe it's very important that in the README file you communicate the expectations about the readiness of your project. You don't want people to start using the project uh, uh, or yeah, a tool. Uh, before it's ready, or at least they, they can use it, but they should understand that it maybe it's not ready yet. Yeah? Um, uh, you should communicate the expectations for and manage contributions to your project, uh, say how people can contribute, uh, and also what are the communication channels. And then um, I really like the, the, to use the badges in the README files. This is a, a nice way to communicate things around your project. So you can say, if you would like to cite my software, this is the DOI. If you would like to download, this is uh, the link to the release. Uh, this is the license and so on. Um, so these things are called badges or shields, uh, I believe. Uh, that's a shields IO uh, project. Uh, so you can put it at the top of your README file, uh, which is nice. Uh, Yo, how am I doing with time? Uh, you're okay, um, but faster rather than slower is probably also good. good. <laughs> yeah. I can speak very fast, you know that, but maybe... Medium <laughs> fast, maybe. Medium fast, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, you can, but I'm, also, I'm almost there. So you can add emojis. Actually, I, I think emojis are a very nice way of making your uh, readme less dry and more inviting and uh, more uh, friendly in expression. Uh, since we're like uh, people are reading it, it's very difficult to express friendliness through the uh, through the text itself. So I really advise using uh, emojis. Um, you can also use animated gifs, which I, actually I was struggling if I should say that. But at the same time, so um, I think it's very good way to uh, communicate uh, very in in an easy way. Describe what your tool is doing without a lot of text. People can just see what the tool is doing. Uh, at the same time, uh, I think that it does decrease the accessibility or yeah of your of your readme. At the same time, if someone if if things about your tool or project are visual, then they yeah they, they're visual anyway. So I'm not sure. Uh, I'm actually interested in this uh, hearing your uh, opinion on that. Um, so it's very important that you use uh, accessible language, uh, simple language. Don't use the jargon. Uh, it's very easy to expect, like you're in your domain, uh, you're describing the tool maybe, or a project which is within your domain. So it's easy to uh, like stay in this bubble and, and use a lot of jargon that you think that everyone should, uh, like the words everyone should be knowing. So it, it's a very nice example with the, uh, um, you may be uh, familiar with XKCD comic and the outer uh, 
uh, Randall Monroe, no, Randall Monroe, I think. Uh, he also wrote, wrote a book which is called uh, Things Explainer, where, where he only uses uh, the most common 10 hundred words um, to explain things. Uh, here is the rocket, which is uh, actually, it's not a rocket, it's an upgoer, because the rocket is no, not one of the 10 hundred most uh, popular words. Um, so he, he, <coughs> he, this is like an exercise of uh, like really being able to explain in very uh, plain words complicated things, which actually turns out to be uh, possible. Um, so, uh, also, don't use uh, acronyms or at least explain them if you, if you do. Um, you can, so we're not going to try it now, but I think after my talk, we'll have a breakout and you're going to try out. There is an online editor which uh, allows you to uh, do the same. So use the only 10, 10 hundred words, uh, most common 10 hundred words to describe your project. Uh, so you'll work on your project description and the readme file. Uh, there are some more resources. Uh, and I, I actually really like the list of awesome readmes. Uh, there's not only the list of readmes, but there's also a lot of uh, resources that are listed that you can use to learn more about how to write good readme files. Um, yeah. And that's me. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, I don't. See, uh, yeah, I don't see the chat. So uh. it's all good. So good. There was one comment. Uh, someone was saying that the words uh, the site thought science was jargon and university. <laughs> so I think we need to use this under advisement, perhaps. That there, there, maybe more than the ten hundred most common words are uh, actually okay. But it does help reinforce the point that sometimes we use words that we don't need to be using. Yeah, exactly. And I think like, oh, 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 it, uh, in some cases, it will be impossible. You can't, sometimes you won't be able to describe your project with only 10 hundred words, uh, like those most common ones. But uh, still, I think it's a nice exercise. <laughs> it's, it's very, uh, to think about it and, uh, and see, um, yeah, how, how actually, it, because we often don't realize that we use a lot of quite complicated words, even if we don't need to. <laughs> okay, uh, shall we, um, <clears throat> since we're running a little bit behind, I'm, uh, I'm gonna suggest we head over to the breakout rooms uh, now. Um, so the plan for our breakout rooms, if that's okay. And thank you very, very much, Mateusz. Sorry for rushing. <laughs> um, How do I answer? Uh, panic? Panic, press, close everything. <laughs> uh, We're good, answer. okay. okay. Right. Someone yes. un unsured me, okay, good. Brilliant. So um, what we're going to do, um, we're talk talking about writing, um, sharing in the readme and avoiding jargon, as we asked you beforehand to actually look at the Upgo of Five. Um, I think a few of us have been sharing anecdotes in chat about the weird things that actually we think should be in our readmes. Uh, um, but we're just going to go maybe six minute breakout room and um, three, three people per room roughly just discuss some of your feelings and experiences about what you found when you ran your through the Upgo of Five. Uh, so when you ran your project vision through the Upgo of Five viewer. Uh, if you haven't, then maybe now is a good time to scramble and quickly do it. Um, <laughs> but I will send you all into the breakout rooms roughly two minutes per person. Uh, all clear? Excellent. Okay. Um, I will send you in different rooms this time. Okay. We're recording again. Um, I hope you had a good breakout room. So we're going to now switch to the last part, which is about contributing guideline and code of conduct. Um, in the call, we have today Karen Lagesson, who, who is our expert for this part. Um, but I'll go through this in one minute to introduce what this part is for and why we're interested in it. So if we go in the next slide. Uh, so you would see this over and over, and we will be highlighting different parts of our vision statement. So building project for collaboration within inclusive community. Uh, and in the next slide, you will see that we're now moving to this part, which is about building for participation and inclusion. So who's making decision? Who's, uh, who's delegating task? Who is it delegated to? How are we planning our event? Uh, how is the community management happening? And who is monitoring what's happening in the community? 
So when we work in an open community, it's all about relationship. Uh, you depend on community members who are volunteers who are working on your project, probably beyond their own personal work time. So you, it's really important how you keep them involved and identify who's the active member, what are their roles, how you can give them uh, autonomy and how you can also keep the governance so your project does not derail. So in the next slide will be what we are going to do with this talk uh, is to make you think about how to create a positive culture, how to think about contribution and collaboration. And please keep note of uh, the fact that this is gonna really influence how you're gonna write your assignments and draft your own contributing guidelines and choose a code of conduct for your project that's very appropriate for your community. So with that, I'm happy to introduce Karen Lagesson. She is a researcher uh, in, in Norwegian Veterinary Institute and also chair of the Carpentries Code of Conduct Committee, which is where I work with her. And I'm a huge fan of her work and I'm happy to have her in the call today. Thank you so much for that uh, very nice introduction. So uh, this talk will have, uh, will focus on two documents in, in this context. And that's the contribution guidelines and also uh, the code of conduct. So the important thing to bear in mind is that you as a project leader, you're trying to build a community around your project. You're trying to attract volunteers to your project and these will have diverse backgrounds and come into your project with different, different expectations. Now, whenever you have a group of people gathered like this, uh, a culture, a group culture is bound to develop, whether you intend it to do or not. And this means that you as a project leader, you have to take initiatives with regards to what kind of culture you want your project to have. Um, if you don't, a project culture will develop uh, without you. And this means that you have to uh, be, make some conscious choices regarding how you want your community to be. be. Uh, what values should your community advocate? How do you want people to interact with each other and with other people? Uh, the thing to remember here is that a project is actually a lot more than just its goal, goals. Um, it's a language, it's a shared set of norms, it consists of people's ex expectations to the project, uh, it's the tools that you choose to use, it's the systems you set up to uh, make decisions, it's the project identity. Um, and all of these things uh, affect the health of your community, uh, the community around your project. And uh, because of that, it will also directly affect the progress of your project. Now, how do you go about shaping the culture you want? Uh, there are two big things that can be done in this context. And that's to have uh, a clear set of contribution guidelines, which will uh, help your contributors, your volunteers interact with your project. And the second is to have a code of conduct. And these are two important vehicles that will help you as a project leader uh, to communicate to your community how you want your community to be. Now, so what we're trying to do is to get people to contribute to your project. It's in this context important that, to remember that your uh, contributors are people uh, with their own worldviews and their own stories. Uh, we need to take this into consideration when we're trying to build a welcoming uh, atmosphere so that people will want to con contribute to your project. Uh, one such community, uh, I'll show an example here, is the, the Carpentries community. Uh, that's the community that I personally am part of. And we've taken a very proactive stance when it comes to community 
uh, to project culture. And I'll show this through both the contribution guidelines and the code of conduct that this project has set up. Uh, so first to the contributing documents. Uh, so first of all, these are readily available within each GitHub repo uh, for, for each set of teaching materials. Um, we do this to make sure that it's easy for people to find them. So the contributing guidelines have to, first of all, they have to be easy to find. If you can't find them, you can't use them. Uh, so what kind of information should these kinds of documents contain? Uh, so they contain information that various kinds of people might want to know. So for your contributors, the people you want to help you out with the project, uh, you want to tell them the process and conventions that they'll need to follow when they're making a contribution. Uh, it should also detail how they are expected to interact with other members of the community. When it comes to uh, the project consumers, these are the people who might want to build off the work that you've done. Uh, it should clearly de detail how they can remix and reuse uh, your work in their own projects. And this file should give, give them a sense of how to do that and what's allowed to do with the material. Uh, you as a project owner, uh, you will want to create and maintain this file and you'll, you should uh, make sure that you keep this file updated. Um, one good thing about writing and creating this file is that it will help sort out for yourself uh, how, uh, how you can have good interactions in your community. So let's uh, look here. Um, for the carpentries, we have, in addition to the contributing document in itself, we've also uh, specifically set up web pages which will help people interact with our community. So this is uh, shown here is a list of channels, uh, communication channels into our project, which helps people help channel people into the parts of the product that they might want to contribute to. And this makes it easy for someone new uh, to find out what they can do. And this is, this is one very good way of doing that. Uh, okay, now we'll move on to the issue of a code of conduct. Now, the basis for this is that uh, to have a well-functioning community, we need to take into consideration that the other pe people uh, that are in our project are not carbon copies of ourselves. If you're lucky, you're able to build a diverse community uh, for your project. And a diversity of people and opinions, uh, opinions will make your project stronger. It will help your project be original and adaptable and durable in the long run. Uh, the issue then becomes, what if something happens in your community that shouldn't? And this is where a code of conduct comes into play. A code of conduct speaks to what is accepted and what is not accepted in your community. It also speaks to what do we as a community do when something that is not accepted happens. So why do you, why do you actually really need a code of conduct? Well, the, there are really three things that a code of conduct does in your community, the role they play, it plays. First of all, it helps invite uh, new people to your project. Simply by saying, hi, we're here, please uh, interact with us. It also sets clear expectations for community members. It tells them how we want people to behave, what kind of interactions we want in our community. Last but not least, and probably most important, 
Uh, having a code of conduct tells your community that you care about it. It tells them that uh, their well-being is important to your project. Uh, and that is probably more, Im more important on a community context, uh, more important than anything else. Um, so here, linked in the presentation that I'm assuming that you'll get access to, uh, there are some examples of code of conduct. Uh, and I'll now show you uh, the Carpentries code of conduct, so you can have a look at that. So if we see here at the top, uh, I'm not, can you see my mouse? Okay. So here at the top, uh, this is the welcoming part. Uh, but we quickly move into the setting expectations part um, by clearly stating that uh, by interacting in this community, by becoming a part of it, we expect you to follow our code of conduct. And we clearly state that not doing so uh, will have consequences. Uh, next, below here, we have uh, described some, a few examples of uh, behaviors that we encourage in our community. And this also helps set expectations for our members. Another thing that you'll see in our code of conduct is that we have clear guidelines for how to deal with incidents. If something happens, we have guidelines and procedures for what to do. And I want to emphasize here that it's very important to actually enforce your code of conduct. The only thing that is worse than not having one is not enforcing it. Because you have, if you have one and you don't enforce it, what you're telling people is that you actually actively don't care about the well-being of your community. Okay. So how do you get started on getting a code of conduct? Well, you need to start to think about what values you want your community to have. What kind of behaviors would you like to see uh, in your community? Uh, also think about how you want to process an incident if something sh should happen and what the consequences should be. Uh, last but not least, uh, you as a project leader, you will have to accept that this is something you have to deal with. Community start, culture starts with you and your attitude towards these kinds of things uh, will permeate your project. Then some takeaways at the end. Um, Encourage those who uh, have, have good practice in your community, those who follow the, uh, follow the contribution guidelines in a good way, those who help, in, help build a good community. Also, uh, make sure to interact with your community to build uh, these things. Um, this will help, uh, help ensure buy-in from your community members. Also set up a process for how to, uh, how to deal with car, uh, code of code on conduct issues. Um, and uh, communicate these, guide, uh, these processes clearly to your uh, community members. Um, my last tip is really, um, if, you, if at all possible, don't write your own code of conduct. Uh, find uh, a code of conduct that you like and copy and adapt that one because uh, code of conduct documents can be quite uh, complicated to write. There are a lot of facets to think about. And that is it from me, uh, Malvika. Thank you so much, Karen. Um... That was fantastic. Do we have some quick questions for Karen to address? We do have some question written down. Yeah. Uh, if you can take a couple of those. The first one is regarding choosing code of conduct. Is there like a set to choose from, from several licenses? Um, 
you will see that uh, well, several of the code of conduct you will find out there uh, actually have a license on the code of conduct. And uh, you will also see that, for instance, on the on the Carpentries code of conduct, we have a history. Uh, so we, we, we clearly state at the bottom where we have the base documents from and the, and the process from it. So uh, the Carpentries code of conduct is, for instance, one code of conduct that you can copy. So we also have a code of conduct for the open life science. Mm -hmm. Someone just asked, is it reasonable to write code of conduct if your community is like 20 people? Yes. Yes. If there are more than one person, you need a code of conduct. And that's because uh, a code of conduct will help. It, it, it helps a lot with community building. The moment it, your community consists of more than the people you already knew, uh, then then a code of conduct comes into play because it, it helps set uh, community ex expectations. It tells people that you are ready for more people to interact. It helps build your culture, and a culture will build yourself uh, build itself unless you choose to do it proactively yourself. Okay, one thing I want to tell people, we're already in one minute, probably ending the call, but I'm happy if people want to hang out and Karen has five more minutes beyond the call to answer a lot of questions. So I'm going to hold those questions for a minute to close the session and we'll continue responding. So the last thing to do um, is one thing that we have been deciding on is the cohort name. And I think Open Seats is quite famous. Is that right? Can we have a nod? And can we also have a nod for the amazing artwork Cassandra has already done? Great. We're going to find a place for that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Cassandra. Now it's officially Open Seats. So you all are Open Seats now. Um, again, uh, reach out to us. Uh, you have uh, our email. For the next four weeks, there will be UCU strikes in higher education. Therefore, if you're in the UK and you have to miss the call, we totally respect that. And if you're behind doing any assignment, we're, we're not going to complain. We're happy to give you more time to finish it. We appreciate that you're supporting something worthwhile. Um, you will see the list of assignments that uh, you're going to be able to do for next two weeks. Next call is February 19th, which is optional. We will be exploring GitHub tutorial. And the next cohort call is February 26th. And with that, those who need to leave, um, thank you so much for joining. And I think we're gonna continue five more minutes uh, with Karen helping us address some of the important questions. So thank you so much for joining. Okay. So those who are staying, can you verbalize your questions so we address them? Cassandra, you had something. Uh, yeah, so I guess the, the one that's more difficult would be, you, I, I'm building a community within a, within a university that will have its own disciplinary procedures, harassment, bullying policy, and things like that. How, I assume it makes sense to work within the boundaries of that, but how do we, how do we reconcile those two things? Like if, you know, how, how do we work together to incorporate what they think is important and their disciplinary procedures? Um, working within an institution, in, institutional framework can be quite difficult because, uh, especially if this is a community based on people who work at the same location, because uh, it is, Excluding somebody from something when it is in their work portfolio is is problematic. Um, so I I would suggest that you discuss this with uh, your management uh, to um, help sort out what would be within the community's purview and what should be pushed up to management. Because there needs to be a del delineation of uh, between of responsibilities in in that uh, that case. Um, one thing, though, uh, having 
having such guidelines even within a community locally is beneficial because it it, it will just having it uh, says something about the culture you want to build about openness about uh, friendliness about helping each other out uh, what's it helps lower the bar for questions to put it to put it like that uh, and helps build interactions so I, I recommend having one So one question is, do you see enforceable behavior differently than suggested behavior? Is um, suggested could behavior could you repeat, re repeat that uh, again, Malvika? Do you see enforceable behavior differently than suggested behavior? Is suggested behavior part of COC or more of participation guideline? Um, so, um, I think you said enforceable behavior. Mm -hmm. Could the person asking that question explain uh, or elaborate on that? Have that person had to leave the call? Okay, maybe they did, but just, just to be clear, mm -hmm. um, any code of conduct is not a policy. It's always a suggestion. So you can't enforce a behavior. You can only establish it as a guideline. Am I right about saying that, Karen? Uh, well, it's, it's um, so in the Carpentries Code of Conduct, we have, uh, we have uh, in the beginning, we have a list of behaviors we encourage. And this is to help give people an image, a picture in their heads of how people should interact with each other. However, a little bit, Below, we also have a list of the types of behavior we don't want. And that's not, a, a, it's not a, um, a complete list. There are other things that we might decide to react to, to but it, it, these kinds of things help people uh, build an image in their head of what's, what's acceptable, what's good, and what's bad. And, um, we want to be uh, flexible in the kind of behavior we choose to react towards. And I want to be clear, uh, a code of conduct um, for the most part deals with behavior. It's uh, things that people say, it's things that people do. And the main guiding line you should have when uh, thinking about enforcing, acting on a code of conduct incident is whether uh, it, your, your guiding light should be your desire to protect your community. Is this behavior that harms your community? Does it, uh, does it stop people from asking questions? Does it stop people from interacting it with each other? And uh, you act from the response, your own response to that question. Uh, and the, the, the consequences of that can, can have a very wide range. We have reactions spanning from um, having a quiet word on the side, telling people that maybe you should change your behavior a bit um all the way until up to banning people permanently from our community uh, and and the response has to fit the action that has be uh, has to be done that has been done but the, the guiding uh, the the guideline is really uh, you need to protect your community make sure that uh, your community uh functions in a way that is that is the way you want it to matthews you had a hand a long time ago do you want to ask yeah i'm not okay um yeah so my, my question is um if you so <clears throat> you have to implement the code of conduct yeah so because you need to re reinforce it uh right yeah Mm. Uh, 
my question is, and it takes time, yeah? So you might not be ready. So is there a way, something like a lightweight solution? So let's say I want to roll out code of conduct in the Netherlands eScience Center and all, all the events that we're organizing. But in the meantime, I have a workshop that I organize tomorrow. And I don't have a code of conduct committee. I don't have a, um, yet the guidelines how to deal with it for the, for the committee. Is there anything I can do now? Uh, to, so it won't be code of conduct, maybe, but it will be some kind of guidelines that I can use. Uh, yeah, what can you advise? Um, it, I don't know of a, um, an instant code of conduct uh, ad people solution. I apologize for that. But um, the most important thing is that you you clearly state that uh, what, what how you want this workshop to be to be. You want people to be friendly. You want them to uh, not interrupt each other unnecessarily. Um, let people speak. Um, encourage people to ask for help. That kind of things. Give some examples of behavior you want uh, in the beginning, and then say. Uh, and and you do that in the beginning of the workshop clearly. And the next thing you do is that you say that if somebody experiences something during this workshop that in some way affects them, that breaches, that, that breaks against the, the kind of culture, the kind of environment you want for this workshop, they should come speak to you. And then, uh, yes, in a larger community, you do want procedures, you want rules, you want a group that can discuss things. But uh it could also be that in a in a workshop then and there if something happens you as a as a workshop organizer have to act then and there uh and if somebody some sometimes you just need to have a quiet word with somebody maybe somebody doesn't recognize that they're speaking over everybody else um and making uh, and well, making sure, making it so that other people can't ask questions, um, or you have somebody who repeatedly walks into the bathroom stalls uh, for the other participants, and then in those situations, you might want to ask them to leave, and it might also have to be other people who are, who are told. So um, you just basically need to be ready to act if something should happen uh, with the baseline that you should protect your workshop participants and make sure that they are able to learn and that's the baseline in a workshop people are there to learn anything anything that stops people from learning is bad yes thank you Okay. okay, Malvika, are we? Where? I see people going to bed. <laughs> Thank you so much, Karen. That was fantastic. Um, I've also started to add some of the links down there and think one of the material that would, we would, both Karen and I would totally recommend is Valerie Aurora's Code of Conduct Handbook that mm. tells you exactly what kind of code of conduct should exist, how to enforce it, and so on. I've been still recording. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining, for giving amazing talks and asking really good questions. Um, see you in Gitter or somewhere else. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. <laughs>